And lady and gents, have I got a person for you to talk to. Melissa Bell with Lady Capulet, who takes Romeo and Julia and gives us a prequel. And so we find out why the feud happens and we find out a lot about Lady Capulet you would be surprised about. Welcome. Hi, Eva, how are you? Uh, I'm jet lagged, how are you? Okay, well, I'm in the middle of rehearsals right now for Lady Capulet, which as you say, is a prequel to Romeo and Juliet. It's, um, it's about Juliet's mother and her her coming of age, uh, coming to Verona, uh, falling falling in love with one and marrying the other, and uh, mm -hmm. about causing the feud that uh, is in Romeo and Juliet. Um, so it is explores what caused the feud. Um, we're rehearsing now for some performances, which are going to be a couple different performances. Uh, some performances are happening in Pennsylvania at a place called uh, Farm Arts Collective. And that is a farm where we'll be outdoors and uh, performing. And then we're gonna be back in New, uh, that's gonna be in um, September 25th and 26th. Uh, if you wanna take a ride up and look at all the trees, that's where that's gonna be. And then we're gonna be back in the city here at Bernie Wall Center on October 2nd. Um, and. Uh, doing one pop-up performance here in New York City as well. What made you come up with this idea in the first place? And, and you stick to the Shakespearean text and you actually make Shakespeare interesting because everyone knows I hate Shakespeare, but I really, really enjoyed this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, it came up because I read a review of Romeo and Juliet. It was by Ben Brantley in the New York Times. And they questioned why Lady Capulet cried so hard at the death of Tybalt. And, um, and then Ben Brantley posed a question, I'd like to see what the playwrights of the future sort of come up with as an answer to this. Mm -hmm. And I listened and I thought, oh, wow, that's an interesting challenge. And I thought about it and I said, it can't be what this show was doing, which was some sort of liaison between Tybalt and, um, and Lady Capulet. It, to cause a feud this deep, it has to be about blood. It's got to be over blood. It has to have a lot of blood and it has to be deep. It has to run really deep, those, those resentments. Um, and that's, and betrayals. So that's what we're exploring. We're exploring betrayals. We're exploring manipulation. We're exploring all of, each member of the family deciding when when they're going to turn and and avenge themselves, you know. You must I, really be enjoying the history of this, I would guess. I'm a history guy. I really like it. And uh, you're uh, this is this is great stuff. All this wonderful dialogue and uh, the right with Italian ladies and, and whatever. Yes, so. yes. Well, we're um, we're doing. It's not iambic pentameter. It is just sort of an antiquated sounding text that I have some tricks that I use to make it sound like I am. Oh, a you fooled me. And then there are a few couplets that just sort of happen naturally. And, um, you know, just all of a sudden there was a rhyme in there. And so it does make it sound like, like it is iambic pentameter, but it's a lot more easy to understand. You never know what your creative demon is going to do when you need when you're writing something like that. That's marvelous. That's right. Well, these characters are very strong and they just really surprised me a lot as I was writing them. I had an outline and I I would follow it, um, you know, the general outline, but then they would surprise me with uh, what they would say at a given moment because, you know, you're really in that moment. And as you're writing that character starts to speak and really take on a life and uh, several times my characters really surprised me with what they did and what they said and um sometimes it came out and i just like burst into tears as i was writing it <laughs> it's like you were possessed it, it is writing is a possession i i believe it i am a playwright i feel like i'm channeling something very deep when I, when I start writing and enter the scene and start to channel what, what these characters are saying. You're almost in a fugue. I mean, you know, in a, in a creative fugue. 
I understand that, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And you kind of get, you get very caught up in it and just keep moving forward with it. So I love Romeo and Juliet and I loved exploring this about what caused the feud because Shakespeare doesn't tell us what causes the feud. He just, he doesn't. He just says there's these two houses that are at war with each other. And so we're going from a time when there was maybe a little bit of dissension between the families. They didn't really like each other um, because of, you know, a debt or something, a debt, which is what I put it. And then, but then the betrayals that happen, um, the sexual betrayal. So it is pretty juicy. Is there a and, lot of stage violence as well? Well, that's what they're rehearsing right now in Central Park is mm -hmm. uh, stage fighting. So yes, there are um, two, two, there is a, a, a big fight scene uh, between Capulet and Montague and Rose. So, is so much fun. Yes, so there's a wonderful fight scene. And then there's, at the end, there's also um, a fight you know, it gets it gets very heated, and there's knives, and there's blood, bloody sheets, and uh, yeah, a lot of things like that. <laughs> and it's so much easier doing it live than on Zoom. I mean, I saw this on Zoom, so I bet live it's even more thrilling. It's it's thrilling, but it is hard, you know, because um, on, on the nice thing about Zoom was. I could see everybody's emotions really up close like this. And that was exciting because mm -hmm. I had not seen that before. Um, when it's live, it is quite exciting in terms of their movement. We have some dances and we have, um, we actually have a beautiful costume that's being made by Sally Ann Parsons, who's a Tony, uh, Lifetime Tony awardee. And she's making a very special costume for Our Lady Capulet because she is a friend of Farm Arts Collective who is sponsoring, producing our first two shows. Wow. So she is doing that um, with us um, and, and giving us this wonderful costume. So we're going to have, you know, of course, more costumes, more excitement, fighting. This sounds like an absolutely great show. And, and really, I, we're loving to see it. I think we, we need to move on. Uh, now but uh my heavens it sounds so exciting and like so much fun i mean that's what theater is supposed to be and i say to that to people all the time you know when when we're out there in the country and kids it's so much fun why isn't it here uh, and good for you i think audiences would be thrilled they sit at the end of their seats and we hear a lot of audible gasps in the audience with this show <laughs> well thanks a lot and thanks a lot for joining us um and eva i think we have some more uh, historical uh, things coming up right yeah, another person who's taken a historical story, and I don't know, she'll tell us what she did with it. Michelle Hampton, you're doing The Black Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. So what have you done with it? Hi, Eva. Good to see you. Hi. Um, so it is. this is a faithful adaptation. It's a sung through musical of Alexander Dumas' okay. um, novel, The Count of Monte Cristo. And it's this epic story of revenge um, uh, centering around a young man, a young sailor, in this case, a young black sailor named Edmond Dante, who is just heroic. He's rescued a ship, he, he gets to shore, he is given a promotion to captain, he's very young, he is reunited with the love of his life, Mercedes, he gets engaged, and then out of nowhere, he's hauled off to prison. Uh, based on a false accusation by some men who are actually very jealous of him. And if you know the story, he stays in prison uh, for 14 years, and then he is, um, he, he finds a way to escape. And with newfound wealth at his disposal, he is able to employ the plans he's, he's thought about um, to take revenge on the men who robbed him of his youth and who put him behind bars. And so he goes, he gets you know, carefully into their lives through the use of disguise. They don't know it's him. And one by one, he takes them down. But he's not a vigilante. You know, he, he's not a violent guy. There's, he, he doesn't run around murdering people. Um, he uses strategy. And that is why the novel so appealed to me. That is why the character so appealed to me. And that is why I started reading 
Dumas biographies. Mm. There are several. And he was just, a, I mean, who could write this story? You know, it, 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 the, the ins and outs and the twists and the plots and the fact that no violence was actually used. He, um, the character, Edmond Dante, he, he studies these people. He knows their weaknesses and he lets them sort of do away with themselves in a way. Um, so it's, it's just fascinating. When I, when I learned about Dumas, I got even more fascinated and I started researching his father because in his autobiography, Alexander Dumas says that the character, the protagonist of this story, Edmond Dante, was inspired by his own father. Now he'd written tons of novels, right? The Three Musketeers, lots of serials, but he was actually inspired by his own father for this story um, and the adventures his father had had and the kind of person he was. So who was Dumas' father? Dumas' father was the son of a Haitian slave. And mm -hmm. he immigrated to France when he was a teen. He worked his way up from the bottom through the French military, the French army, and ended up as a general in chief, the highest ranking general in the French army under Napoleon Bonaparte. When, when, when all the battles were won, um, thanks to Alexander Dumas' father, Bonaparte took power. And he came in with this Napoleonic code, which was extremely racist. Um, if you were a person of color, you couldn't live where you wanted. You couldn't marry who you wanted. Your children couldn't go to the schools that they wanted. So because Dumas' father was the inspiration for the character of Edmond Dante, it, it made sense to me that when he closed his eyes to write this novel, he was seeing a person of color. Um, not only with the with the characteristics, but also the physical traits of of his father, and so that is how it became the Black Count. The Black Count of Monte Cristo is really the actual Count of Monte Cristo, not the guy you see in the movies. <laughs> how did you decide to make it a musical? Yeah, well, that yes, because <laughs> good question. Um, I decided to make it a musical because from the from the moment I started reading it, I heard music, um, I, <laughs> and so I said, this is an epic story and it needs to be framed with music. And so I started hearing music and I started writing and that's how it became a musical. And it's playing on, uh, it's going on at the Broadway Bound Festival, September 29th, October 1st, correct? Yes, at Theater Row, thank you, Ava, yes it is. So um, yeah, this is the first full production. I've done some readings of it in the past, but this is the first full production. So we have these lush costumes by Debbie Hobson and we have these terrific terrific lighting um, by uh, Greg Solomon. We have an excellent sound designer, Kimberly O'Loughlin. Our director is Kate Camerata, who I'm sure everybody here knows. She's been and, a past guest. Of course. And uh, the musical director is Seth Weinstein, who is a treasure um, and he, he brings so much heart and passion to the project. Uh, this is not your first musical then? Is it, it is my first, actually my first full length musical. Uh -huh. um, I wrote an, another little one um, that was produced by New Musicals Inc. Uh, a few years ago, I collaborated. I did the music for, um, it was a little internet musical called Happy Landings, uh -huh. uh, very different style of music. This is much grander, if you will, cool. but hopefully hummable. That sounds very exciting. I mean, gosh, I mean, it just seems, you know, I, I, can't, I can't help but think of Al Alexander Hamilton, who also was like this immigrant from, poor immigrant from, you know, and have, and all he went through. So it's just interesting that his father, because we don't know too much about Alexander Dumas' father, we just know his novels, but he had such an interesting life and that you yes. discovered it. Absolutely. And Alexander Dumas, being the son of his father, was also a person of color. And a lot of people don't know that. And so I wanted to make the connection between the protagonist and Alexander Dumas' father. So I brought both Dumas, the, 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 the novelist and his father, into the story so that the audience hopefully can make a connection between that protagonist and the man who was the model for him. All this, all this wonderful history, and I, I keep saying that, in this particular time, um, you know, history, historical things are becoming quite popular, quite fashionable, and, and that's good too. That, that's good for you because I, I don't know. I think people are a little tired of what's going on now, and uh, perhaps uh, we need to see some some history and remind ourselves who we are. Absolutely, and I think we all. It, in, and this was not written as a political piece by any means, um, but there is, I think, 
a lot of things, there are a lot of things, you know, the theme of revenge, yes, it's a big theme. That's the thing most people remember about the Count of Monte Cristo. For me, I picked up on the injustice, you know, and I think there's a lot of relevance to what's going on in the Justice Department and in the world around us today um, that made it even more exciting for me uh, to present to audiences in the 21st century, even though it was written almost 200 years ago. Um, it's not presented as an historical piece. It's presented as this great, you know, thrilling edge of your seat kind of um, kind of it's show. Grand theater. That's, that's wonderful. That's what we need. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'm so excited we get to see both the Black Count of Monte Cristo and Lady Capulet. So, yay! Thank you. Thank you, Ava. Thank you for having me. And thank you for both being on. Yes, and, and now I'd like to introduce our next guest, who I guess we, we delve into the history of himself with his modern living cycle, Rick Scheinmel, who I met through Hot Keys a long time ago. Jeff Wise put together this incredible soap opera, which was a cult classic. We go at two in the morning with our flashlights all we didn't even know where we would end up. It was like this hidden secret thing and and, and the core audience we come and we follow it along. It was just the coolest thing ever. So what you, and now you, and we've had all these musical people on but and you're the librettist so you you give them the book to their music. Uh, working on hot keys was a real treat and i didn't even realize how important it was to the community at large i mean for me as an actor it was relentlessly challenging i was three hours of new material new material every week a live late night musical soap opera and we had the best audience in the world of just a they followed us we went from theater to theater we started out we started out with the naked angels and then we moved to um uh at to manhattan class company and then ended up at ps 122 and it was almost like 10 years of doing that show. And I mean, it was really about a the AIDS crisis that was happening around us. And it was, you know, indistinguishable from the show. I mean, that's Hot Keys. The main story was about this guy, Billy Bunghole Battersall, who uh, had a, uh, a cure for what they were calling the taint. But he was also an analogy for the disease because he would eat his own victims. Uh, but anyway, you know, they really set me off on into this world. I mean, I was a big part of the whole world, but you know, when everybody started coming to see it and it really helped, uh, you know, with everything. And then working with Penny Arcade was a real treat too. Uh, back in the day when she used to do plays about her own life and she inspired me down the road to write these plays about my life. You know, I, uh, for those of you who don't know, I've written a series of uh, live of these, um, they are creative nonfiction, although I didn't realize that. I'm just telling true stories about my family that are turned into little mini musicals. We've done them all at La Mama. Uh, I've written seven of them. We've performed them in three different times, and they've actually been done separate uh, from the pieces at La Mama. They've been restaged at other theaters uh, with other actors over the years. And um, let's see, I have written another one called Oyster. It's the seventh one in the series, uh, and I'm very excited about it, but it, it hasn't actually gotten to the stage yet. Uh, you know, it's just difficult um, to get things up and get them going, although La Mama has been incredibly supportive and, and it's just has sort of an open invitation as long as Nikki Perez is there to continue the series. Um, but now, um, I about like seven years ago, <clears throat> maybe eight years ago, when Lost in Staten Island happened, I got asked to join. I applied for and was accepted into the BMI uh, Musical Theater Workshop. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, that's this like long-standing workshop that has been helped for fostering the creation of musical theater uh, for the last 40 years. And you can go back to like uh, Little Shop of Horrors or Once on This Island or, or, or even more currently, like um, that show In Transit uh, was developed at the workshop. And um, so anyway, they uh, gave me an opportunity to work with the librettist division. And then I won this award called the Harrington Award, which for me was a game changer because... I never really considered myself a librettist. I just love the way music works in a story, uh, but uh, they did. And it was their understanding of me that had made me decide that, you know what? I, I want to focus on this now, just giving a stab, writing musical stories, stories that encompass music in a way to help tell it. And um, in the workshop, I've had four pieces so far. I've been in there about eight years that have been developed into various stages into musicals. And I've moved away from writing about myself and I've been creating, you know, fictional stories about imaginary characters, which I know everybody else does, but I never did it before. So 
and that's been very, very exciting. Um, but that's why I haven't been doing much performing or, um, or even putting my own material out there because it takes so much energy. I mean, you, you guys know how much energy it takes to get a job as an actor. It's like, it's not just about like showing up and rehearsing. It's about being part of the community and being in the know and going to things and getting cast and being part of it all, which I love very much, but it takes so much energy. And, you know, um, uh, creating a job for an actor also which, takes a great which deal. Which play did you do with Penny Arcade? Oh, yeah. What was that? Which play did you do with Penny Arcade? I did a bunch of them. Uh, the ones that she wrote about her own life. Uh, let's see, one was called Invitation to the Beginning of the End of the World. And another one was called uh, like Three Pennies. Um, the ones that were at La Mama, when she would do the stories that she had other actors tell about her life before she, well, she was still doing solo work, but for a period of time, she wrote a series of shows. Oh, uh, La Miseria. <laughs> La Miseria was a lot of fun. I got to play Saint Sebastian, and basically in La Miseria, all of these saints come to life and like taunt her, and you know, but it's still performance art. She had these, she reenacted a period in her life where these, her Italian family was just domineering and she was going to school and the nuns were telling her that she was sinful. And at one point in the play, she had nuns, people dressed as nuns, throwing mud at her. And uh, it was really amazing. Well, listen, working with Penny Arcade is an amazing experience. And I, I have tons of memories. Um, but it's her form that I took to create my show. I mean, she, I don't know where she got it from, but the idea of people reenacting a live event for an audience while the performance artist experiences walking through their own personal history is exactly what modern living is. You know, like I'm both the storyteller and the main character and um, I'm really eager to do the whole series now. Um, that's what I'm applying for grants to do. I wanted the seventh one, which is what I've been working on lately is called Oyster. And instead of it being about my family, I wrote about my theater family, about the little company of actors who've been putting on my shows. Uh, and in the story, we're at a reading where, where the actors come over my house to uh, read the first draft of a new play called Oyster. And then the whole thing just falls apart. And uh, <laughs> I don't want to give away any spoilers, especially since it's like years from anybody seeing it. But it's a very exciting piece about what it means to uh, have a theater family. And meanwhile, those same actors are portraying my family within the story, within the story. And uh, it ends up at La Mama, which is what all the shows end up doing, if you've ever seen them. They don't take place in a fictional place. They take place at La Mama while you've come to see the show, which is also something I got from Penny, you know, so. Yeah, but you see, the thing is the old belief in playwriting was like playwright should never hide behind his or her characters, but things have changed because now almost everything which is very, very popular is autobiographical in a way. You talk about your own life, like uh, you writing a memoir on stage, you know? There has to be a great deal more self-promoting now because there's so much more self-producing. Uh, I'm an author myself, and I really do appreciate the old school when the author wrote and the publisher published and sold. Uh, now it's become almost effortless to produce one's own work, which is definitely the current fashion, but selling it is something else entirely. Um, however, right now, uh, we do have to move on, and I'd like to thank Richard Scheinmel for the first part of an informative conversation on the trials of working in the theater in New York City. The second part of this interview will be streamed at a later date. Eva? Well, it's that wonderful time of year, time of day, when we get to see Jay Michaels, an indie influencer. Take it away, Jay. This is Jay Michaels. And this is Indie Influencer. And this is high drama. The very meaning of indie, independent, is doing things in many ways, all alone. So let's talk about the ultimate in all alone theater, the one person show. And this one particular one person show, I'm very fond of. Celeste Mancinelli worked as a very profitable and very visible actress for many years. And then she decided to take a break. So she took her communication skills and decided to give back. She became a professor of speech pathology. Professor, that's a noble profession. And then after many years and a very profitable career in that, she decided to retire. She reached a crossroads in her life at that point and needed to rediscover herself. So she walked the Camino. If you don't know what the Camino is, it is a 200 mile pilgrimage. Oh, 
200 miles. If it were me, 200 miles to find myself, maybe I'd stay lost. This brought her clarity. And it also brought her back to the stage. Crying on the Camino, a one-person show written and performed by Celeste Mancinelli and directed by Richard Sibelico, will hold a special benefit performance off-Broadway on Thursday, October 7 at 7.30 p.m. at the former Pearl Theater. Gorgeous space, now called Theater 555 at, you guessed it, 555 West 42nd Street between 10th and 11th Avenues here in glorious NYC. I say a special one night benefit performance in New York to distinctify from the fact that she has taken this show on tour and for the last two months, she has played to standing ovations outside of New York. Celeste is a prime example of indie artists at work, taking life's journey and then bringing it to the stage for all of us vicariously to go on the same journey. One person shows, reminiscent of the great storytellers of history. Storytellers. Nothing has ever happened. Nothing will ever happen without storytelling and storytellers. So the next time you want to write or produce or perform, do it. Even by yourself, independently. You just might change the world. This is Jay Michaels, this is Indie Influencer, and this is always High Drama. And the next show will be October 9th, and we will have lots to discuss. Maybe I'll even talk about my time in England.